Science, Dr. Amanda here with the next video in my series, Standards Explained. And today we're going to be looking at ASA 530 on audit sampling. Now, if you are an international auditing candidate, then this is compliant with ASA 530. They are internationally harmonized. So everything I talk about here will be applicable to you as well. Now, the first thing I want to talk about before we actually dig into the actual standard is the question of why we have sampling in the first place. And there's a couple of different reasons. The first one is that we actually give reasonable assurance. Remember that we're not giving a guarantee. So we're giving reasonable assurance. We're not testing every single transaction. Even reason, the idea of reasonable assurance tells us that. The second reason why we use sampling is because audits are performed under time pressure. We have certain dates by which we have to report by to our regulatory authorities um, and to the stock market. And so therefore we have very limited time to complete our audits and it'd be impossible, especially in situations where now we have clients with very large transaction volumes to actually be able to test all of their transactions within the time pressure. So we have to do this thing called sampling. A quick browse of the table of contents here. So we're actually going to talk about some definitions, which is why I didn't quite define all of our sampling terms straight away. Our requirements are the parts that are legally enforceable. And I will talk about a few sections of the explanatory material. Specifically, um, there are a couple of different appendices. So I'd recommend looking at Appendix 2 and Appendix 3 as well as Appendix 4, and I'll give you a brief preview of each of those. So what exactly is the scope of the standard? So if we zoom in here and we look at our little section there that says the scope, well, this standard applies when we decide to use sampling in performing audit procedures. We use sampling in lots of different ways. Um, and again, because this is part of the 500 series, it's all part of our process to gather evidence. So we know that to be able to generate our audit opinion, I need to actually gather audit evidence. And I know that I have a range of different procedures to gather that evidence. So the things that go into, I guess they're components of audit evidence, there's going to be two things. The first one is going to be the procedures. And the procedures are how we collect the evidence. Um, what are we going to use? Tracing, vouching, analytical procedures. The other question is the question of how much. All right. And this is where our sampling topic really comes into play. So the idea of how much is the idea of sampling. It's very rare that um, currently we would look at all transactions within a firm. Now, what are our objectives in the standard? If we just zoom in a little bit here, so that's a little bit larger. Well, if we look at our objectives, is that when I use sampling, I wanna provide a reasonable basis for drawing conclusions about the population from which the sample is selected. So there's a few words here that you might not know very well. And the first one uh, is our conclusions, and that's really, is an account misstated or not? The population, which I'm gonna talk about, and then the sample. So we wanna make sure that when we're sampling, we're making good conclusions, because essentially what is happening when we're sampling is this is the entire set of transactions. I pick some of those transactions, and then I make my conclusion based on looking at a few items, but generalizing about the whole. And that can result in some issues if your sample isn't correctly uh, selected. Um, so let's look at the definitions just in case you're unaware or unsure. So sampling is when I collect less than 100% of items. So if you're doing an analytical procedure, for example, there's no sampling because you're looking at everything. Now, it says here, all sampling units have a chance of selection. The key thing to remember here is that it's not an equal chance. 
All right, so a lot of students often get caught up here in this bit where it says a chance of selection. It's not an equal chance of selection. We might want to give some items more chance than others. Okay, let's move on to the second term, population. So the population is the entire set of data from which a sample is selected. Now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing because let's say you have uh, some sort of audit procedure and we're going to look at document number one and then we're going to match something in document number one to document number two and then we're going to match that to perhaps some sort of journal entries in document number three. Okay, so whatever we're doing here, it looks like we're tracing of some sort. The population is essentially what I like to call the starting point. So our population is going to be this one here. I'm also going to collect evidence type 2, evidence type 3, but the population is where I start. And that's really important to remember. When you're designing your audit procedures, you have to pick a starting point. This is where I'm going to select my sample from and then I'm going to follow my sample from here through to each of these other stages. So just remember that our population is that starting point. Now there are some risks in association with doing sampling. Sampling risk is that I might make the wrong conclusion um, based on my sample if uh, compared to what I would use if I tested everything because I've selected a sample incorrectly. And that sampling risk can lead to some wrong conclusions. If I'm testing internal controls, I might say that controls are more effective than they actually are. So I might say control risk should be low when it should be medium. Okay, And this is quite serious. This is the sort of issue we're primarily concerned with because we're likely to have understated the level of risk. And in this instance, it's very likely to result in insufficient evidence. And that increases the chances that I'm going to have an inappropriate audit opinion. So we have to be really careful there. The other option or the other risk is this one here. I'll do it in a different color. Let's use yellow. Um, I might say controls are less effective than they actually are or that a material misstatement exists when it doesn't. So that's really like saying control risk is high when actually the proper result should be medium. Now here in this instance, it usually just results in additional audit work. All right, there is no increased risk in this instance of the wrong opinion like we have back up here. The only thing that um, does have an impact here is that we will end up decreasing our profit margin because that additional audit risk takes increased audit effort and increased hours of work by the auditor. Now let's look at our other definitions here. I'm going to zoom in. Non-sampling risk is the risk that I make the wrong conclusion for anything else. What sort of reasons could they be in that situation? There could be human error. Um, I might be really tired, I might overlook something. Uh, there could be some fraud that might um, imp influence the uh, conclusion that we come to. So non-sampling risk, sometimes we can try and control that by trying to have good processes, but some things are out of our control. Now what is an anomaly? Anomaly is a misstatement or deviation that is demonstrably not representative of misstatements or deviations in the population. So this is something that is irregular. It's not what we would expect to see. Sampling unit means the individual items in the population. So remember earlier I had my population. Um, my sampling unit are going to be the individual items that I check. So that sampling unit could be a journal entry. It could be a customer. It could be an inventory item. It could be a sale. All right, so an individual one of those. Now we're moving into some other definitions. Statistical sampling is just a method of sampling. And in the appendix, um, I think it might be appendix four, it talks about a number of different options and statistical sampling is one of those. I'm just gonna scroll down here. 
we also have the term stratification. So this is dividing a population into subpopulations. The most common one that we see there is when we do something called aging accounts receivable. And when we age an accounts receivable, we divide it into uh, ones that are less than 30 days, transactions that are 31 to 60 days, 60, oh, sorry, 61 to 90 days, and 90 days plus. And we'll do that because we're trying to find perhaps uh, bad debts. So we would look in this particular area. Now, you don't always have to stratify, but it is useful if you think that there are different subgroups that might have different characteristics. Item number I is the tolerable misstatement. And that's a monetary amount set by the auditor um, of which we seek to attain a specific level of assurance. So essentially, the tolerable misstatement is like the materiality level for a specific account. Now, that's usually going to be based on the main level of materiality, but adjusted for risk because of the particular account or the particular process. Now, the tolerable misstatement we use when we are doing substantive testing. But when we are testing internal controls, then I'm going to use something called the tolerable rate of deviation. That's usually some sort of percentage rate of control failure. So if the control doesn't work, you know, 1% of the time, 4% of the time, there'll be a certain percentage that is acceptable and anything higher than that will typically mean that we need to increase our control risk assessment, which will result in also a decrease in detection risk. So that's a whole lot of different terminology, and you'll notice that the definitions was quite large there. And there is only really one and a half pages of requirements. You might think that seems a bit small, because these are really mostly principles about how we do our tasks. So what do our requirements actually say? The first bit starts about sample design, size, and testing. So when I design my sample, I need to think of what is the purpose of the audit procedure and what population am I going to be selecting it for? So that really means that what you need to do is know what you are testing, design a procedure to suit, and then I'm just going to make some room here and then select a sampling method that is appropriate. So if I'm testing, for example, cutoff, um, I'm going to want to use a block method because that's most useful to actually doing what I need to do. So it's about selecting the right uh, sampling method to actually go with that sample. The next one is that my sample size should reduce sampling risk. Now, there are lots of different ways to calculate sample sizes, and there are um, statistical, there are statistical and non-statistical methods to calculating sample size. The one that is used most often by firms is non-statistical. That was because in the past, it has been difficult to test large sample sizes. We might see more statistical sampling in the future um, as we might perhaps move to more audit automation. Now, the last part of my requirements is that I shall select items in a way that the sampling unit in the population has a chance of selection. Now, remember earlier, I said it's important to recognize that it's also not an equal chance. So you might give larger transactions or more risky transactions, a greater chance of selection, but that you've included everything in the population. You haven't excluded any transactions. So those are the things to talk about or think about when we're doing our uh, planning part. Now, what do we need to think about when we're performing the audit procedures? Well, I need to perform the procedure like we talked about in ASA 500. Um, if I can't run the procedure on the item that I've tested, then I need to pick a replacement one. That's pretty simple. I just can't ignore that. And if I can't apply the audit procedure for some reason, and I can't have an alternative, 
then I need to consider um, changing my control risk assessment or thinking perhaps that there might be a material misstatement and potentially uh, limiting my scope. So if I'm doing um, substantive testing, I might also need to consider a limitation of scope if I can't collect that audit evidence or do that audit sampling. Now I don't go into, with my students, I actually don't go into a lot of sample size calculation because I say, you know, whatever firm you're going to go to, they will have their own sampling uh, requirements and methodology. But the thing that I do say to them is that you need to know well, what happens if you find something. So if we find any deviations or misstatements, the thing that I need to do is investigate, all right? I need to evaluate their possible effect on the audit and other areas. So what does that mean? I usually, and the instructions I give my students, is that you want to find out, is this a one-off issue? Or is this part of a recurring problem? Now that might mean a few different things. You may need to select another sample and do another test. You might need to do some analytical procedures. You might need to talk to management to try and find out, well, what on earth is going on? Because um, we're trying to find out, is it what they call an anomaly, like a one-off thing? Um, or is it something that is going to repeat or recur? Because if it is a recurring issue, even if it's only very small, you might have perhaps a, an issue that only results in a one cent misstatement. But what if this happens one billion times over? Well, then that could potentially result in a material misstatement. So in the nature and cause, what, why, why did it happen? Is it one off? Is it recurring? Select another sample, consider analytics and talk to management. The thing we also have to do, once we're fairly certain we have misstatements, is project that misstatement. So that means it says project misstatements from the sample found to the population. And that really is just using a particular formula. So you take the errors from the sample, this is of course in dollars, all right, then you divide that by the value of the sample. So let me move this here. We have our errors from the sample. We divide it by the value of the sample and that's going to give us a percentage. And then we multiply that by the value of the population. Okay, so if I find out that perhaps I found errors in sales, I've got the value of the sample from the journal entries, and I find out that let's say perhaps 5% of my sample has an error. Well then, if I've picked my sample correctly, theoretically 5% of the population will also have an error. So that's going to give me what we call our projected misstatement. And then what you want to do is you want to then compare this to our tolerable misstatement for that particular account. All right, so if our projected misstatement is greater than our tolerable misstatement, we have potentially something we might need to uh, adjust, ask management to adjust. If it's less, then you might say that it is immaterial. Now I did mention wanting to add two extra or a couple of extra components from the explanatory material. The first thing I want to talk about is Appendix 2 and Appendix 3. Now you might see here examples of factors influencing sample, influencing sample size for tests of controls and for substantive testing. So this is still the same. Things influencing sample size. This one is for test of controls. This one is for substantive testing. But it's really giving you ideas of when you might want to increase or decrease your sample size. So, so it's not necessarily saying collect more or collect less in specific numbers, but generally when are you going to want to collect more and when are you going to want to collect less? I always tell my students to flag this because if you get stuck trying to figure out whether your sample should be smaller or larger, this can be really helpful. And the last one that I actually wanted to include 
was Appendix 4. Now the reason I want to add Appendix 4 is because Appendix 4 actually has some sample selection methods. So it talks about a number of different methods, random, systematic, monetary unit sampling, and these two are actually sort of linked together a little bit, haphazard, which is a non-statistical method, and then block selection. Now out of all of these, the one that is used most often by real auditors is haphazard. I talk about sample selection in one of my other sampling videos. So that's it for my video on ASA ISA 530 audit sampling. If you have any questions, as always, please pop them in the comments. You can find me on social media. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. We will have a full set of auditing standards videos coming out very soon. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.